welcome students, teachers, and the generally curious to the final episode of our summer sessions addressing the Constitution in American life. We are the Friends of Publius, whose goal is to provide some substantive foundation to understanding America's constitutional framework, as well as provide some alternative views that may provoke your own rethinking of our system of government. With us, as always, is the youngster, Dr. James Michael Williams from the University of San Diego, who is still getting over the painful experience of watching the Giants get swept by the divinely inspired Dodgers. Coming to us from Bismarck, North Dakota, is Professor Chris Cavanaugh, the poster child of charm and grace amongst the group. Then we have the voice of Waukesha, Wisconsin, and the man who every waking moment is spent with the words of the founding generation, Professor Tim Moore of the Center on the Study of the Constitution at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and myself, David Richmond, who wonders every day what I must have done to anger the gods to such a degree that they took me from my childhood home of Huntington Beach, California, and landed my flabby physical frame in Bakersfield during the summer. I'll just never understand that. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm sure penance is in order. <laughs> we conclude our summer series with a discussion focusing on what challenges might face American constitutional democracy in the 21st century. The favorite discussion, discussion topic of uh, Professor Williams. <laughs> Given that we've already lived one fifth of the 21st century, I think we have some idea of what some of these challenges might be. But in all honesty, Unit 6 does present us the opportunity to address what I believe are some very fascinating questions about the values and principles in our constitutional order and to make some judgments about the utility of this 18th century document in the 21st century world. So let's start off uh, with the, the expert about the Constitution, its language, its words, and that's Professor Tim Moore. Tim, in the preamble of the United States Constitution, it states that one of the goals for the nation's mission statement, or from the nation's uh, mission statement, is to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. This seems to imply, in my opinion, the framers were hoping for a perpetual union. Yet, Thomas Jefferson would later write that it would be up to each generation to decide the direction that government would take. Now, I know after knowing you for a very long time that you hate being asked to be a mind reader, but to what degree do you think the framers believe they are creating a constitution for generations to come? Or was this, in their opinion, a temporary kind of thing that would, you know, and, and maybe I'm asking you to explain the mind of the 18th century, uh, you know, intellectual uh, political thought. Well, um, in your uh, in your question, you used uh, I think a really important word: the idea of perpetual. Um, there, uh, that word "perpetual" kind of shows up in a, a lot of the founding documents, most notably the Articles of Confederation. There was this notion that they were creating a perpetual union. Um, so perpetuity, I think, is is actually uh, an interesting part of your question. Um, I would say before I, uh, first of all, as I don't know, that's the honest answer. Uh, but here's what I do know. I, I think um, the founders were thoroughly rooted in the Enlightenment. And I, I think uh, a part of what that means is they believed in, in a, a progression and progress. Um, more perfect union is another one of those, I think, progression type phrases in the, in the uh, preamble. So although, and another thing I'd like to, like to propose is, I don't know that they were necessarily committed to this particular piece of paper with these particular clauses and these particular phrases being forever. Um, I, I have to think that a, some of them believe that the people were more important than the document. And so therefore, this union is more than just a constitutional arrangement, um, that maybe this union was more cultural and, and more uh, social 
that would be that would carry through through in perpetuity even though maybe a rule book a constitution wouldn't now they also put amendments into this into the mix as well so may, maybe there's a commitment to progress and maybe uh, amendments that would radically alter or change the original constitution which i i think we've mentioned before maybe the 14th is the best example of that so i think there's probably a yes and no to your answer uh i mean Jefferson glibly, you know, mentioned that they ought to be rewritten every 19 years, and Madison takes him to task on that as being ridiculous. Uh, and Madison did a lot of study, and he he noticed that constitutions uh, don't last long. I mean, in that sense, the British system is greatest because they have no written, and it's just a collection of stuff that they've done over time. Uh, so, uh, so in that regard, they, they truly do have a constitution for the ages. So they're, because in some, in part, because they're not bound to a single document. Well, I, part of my motivation for asking this is, uh, is a significant portion of this country believes in the fact that the constitution was divinely inspired and therefore it is, you know, almost like a tablet. It's, it, it's, you know, in stone. Uh, uh, there. To your knowledge, did the framers look upon it that way? Um, well, I think anytime you uh, anytime you you invoke some kind of divine inspiration in the uh, in the creation of a founding document, you kind of do get a little rigid and stiff about the uh, uh, you know giving it up. Uh, you know, there's, it's almost like a, a sin if you you uh, you give it up or abandon it. So um, I I don't. Uh, I don't share that view that uh, the Constitution was divinely inspired. In fact, the uh, Benjamin Rush, the person that's you know kind of said that about the the convention, I mean, the next year and a half, anti-federalists just pilloried him, made fun of him. Uh, it just it was hilarious the the things they said about him for invoking you know the hand of the the hand of God. Uh, so, but it it is it is a hard thing. I think if you put that high of a bar on the creation of, of your country's founding document. Chris and Mike, I kind of feed off, off that. I'm wondering, to what degree do you think we're bound by that 18th century document? Because to me, that, that seems to be the key question of the 21st century is to what extent are we bound to this document in the way that we govern ourselves? Well, uh, I, don't, um, I don't know who wants to start, but I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think this is, if you think about it, and this is what I would tell my students, this is what we call these guys in Philadelphia, the framers. And I said, if you think about you're driving through a neighborhood and you're watching a subdivision go up, what do you see? You see a framework of homes, right? So you, they've given us this framework. Someone else has got to come in and do some electrical, do some plumbing. Maybe it might be Tim the Tool Man more. Um, you got to you know, you got to do some drywall stuff, you got to paint, you know, you got to do some landscaping. So there's all kinds of things that has to happen. And um, so are we, I think the constitution is given to us in 1787, ratified 1788, provides a floor. And I think there's a, a book, uh, um, is Gannett, is that his name, Tim? Uh, Jonathan uh, Gannett, yeah. Jonathan Gannett, Gannett, with a P. Gannett, yep. Okay, who, who, who talks about the first Congress. So if you take a look at the first Congress, they're some of the first remodelers, right? So I think that are we bound to it? Um, not like an albatross around our neck. I don't think we should be. I think they, I, I, I don't know, because, you know, we, we talk about the founders and framers, they're not monolithic, but I think they might be surprised that we were so reluctant to make changes because they made changes after 10 years. Yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I would add to that. And, um, in previous sessions, Tim has really focused in on this um, fact that the founders were really influenced by their experiences, right? I mean, they were very smart people. They read a lot, but they also have these lived experiences. So I think that's something that we should consider that they had lived under many different, many, many, many different kind of kinds of constitutions, both in their colonies, maybe the states, the articles, um, British rule. Um, so the idea that they thought that maybe they had figured it out in 1787, I kind of I doubt that. Um, I also think that it is telling that, you know, we have 27 amendments to the constitution and 45% of those were passed by the founding generation, right? The first 12, um, which is again, an indicator that maybe 
we should not be as bound to it. Um, I often tell my students, uh, you know, I teach African politics and we talk a lot about culture in Africa and how there's a worship of ancestors. And sometimes the students will snicker about that as an idea. And I think, well, I bring up, well, what do we do with our own constitution? It's, it's our own form of ancestor worship, the way that we literally put these people on pedestals and, and seal documents <laughs> and put them underground and stuff. So, um, and my final point to your question, are we bound by it? To me, that raises the question of sovereignty, right? And I think the experiment is that the people are sovereign, uh, the people are sovereign through their constitution. So I think we are bound to live under the constitution, but that does not mean that, that the constitution does not change as people's conceptions of what it means to live in a democratic re republic change over time. So um, the constitution is the vehicle for the people to express their sovereignty and what it means to them in particular moments. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go back, so sorry, David, um, just on that, that divine intervention thought. Um, and when kids bring that up or other people bring that up, I always ask, well, do you believe then that the Supreme Being or God, or whoever you pray to, um, do you think that he wanted uh, a, a four and a half million people to be treated as, you know, three fifths of a person? Did you think that if it was ordained by God, he was going to be OK with the slavery preservation within the document? Or is he going to wait until we have a, a civil war and 720,000 approximately people killed all in trying to achieve a more perfect union? So if you think it's divinely inspired, I'm, I, would, I would question that. I, 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 can't, help but, I can't help uh, but think of Lincoln's, um, you know, his Gettysburg. He seemed to infer that the Constitution should be in perpetuity, you know, shall not perish from the earth, I think was the, um, was the phrase that he mentioned. So, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm circling back to maybe a mixed bag, whether, you know, they ex the founders expected it to last forever. Um, and I, and I know that, uh, speech makers in, in, uh, significant events are tend to, uh, use hyperbole, but I, I think Lincoln, we, we may have to take that, his, his statement seriously, that maybe there was a commitment to perpetuity. Well, I am curious, and Mike, this is kind of to you based upon what we've talked about already. Is there any other nation and, and let's limit it to, you know, Western style democratic nations is there any other nations that, that have this deification of, of the creators? Or again, is this, is this what makes us exceptional, that, that we deify our framers uh, uh, to a significant degree? I mean, because England is a common law tradition, I, I, I obviously don't think, I mean, there's key figures in English history and English law, but I'm just wondering, is, is any other nation, and of course, this is to Mike, but Tim and Chris jump in that that treats their constitution the way we do. That's a really good question, and I don't. I I'm going to say off the top of my head, I'm going to say no. But it's it's interesting because um, talking about American exceptionalism, we do have the long like we are the oldest constitutional republic in the world, right? Just under just around 240 years, right? Uh, I disagree with that, but uh, right. go ahead. But then we have changed our constitution the le least amount. Like there's a project out there looking at democratic cons constitutions. Most other countries have these have these places in their history where they kind of rewrite the script. Think about France, Germany, others. So for them to, like, who would you deify, right? It's harder because there are these multiple founding moments. So I think this is part partially just a cultural question. Like we... I guess we kind of deify Lincoln to some extent, but we don't, there, there are other words we could use for Lincoln that we don't, like we don't call him the second founder or the, the father in the way that we talk about the father figures of the founding. And just that language, the way we imagine that period, or even a Teddy Roosevelt or an FDR. I mean, all these people who've been there that in other societies, those were moments of dramatic constitutional change. And I know there are legal historians and political scientists who will say, yeah, and we get that in the Civil War, we get that with the New Deal. Um, but the Civil War is unique in the New Deal. We don't have any major changes to the Constitution other than <laughs> alcohol, right? Um, anyways, it's, it's a different cultural sort of script that we're playing with, and it, it allows us to, I think, 
go, go back to 1787 or 1789 because that's the period we are forced back to. We don't have any other founding moments. I, I, I uh, as Mike was mentioning a couple things, it strikes me as it seems, you know, Moses comes down the mountain with the tablets, and there's clearly a moment where, uh, where uh, that particular culture says, "Oh, we we became a culture." Uh, we got this law. Uh, so I wonder if, I mean, there were a lot of uh, Christians around at the founding. So I wondered if there's, I wonder if this is kind of like the, the convention is the Moses figure and, and they're giving us this thing. And, and it, that imagery kind of stuck, I think, yeah. in the people's mind at the time. I think that's probably what motivated Rush to say what he did. Yeah. But I think since then, I think a lot of people maybe see it that way. That it's you know the convention and these the founding fathers are the lawgivers like because uh, in the ratification they talked about them in you know with Salon and Moses and the great lawgivers of history uh, so I, I think that it's it's almost like there's this Mount Sinai moment that Philadelphia <laughs> is is uh, configured as so Chris uh, moving on here a little bit based upon both historical evidence and contemporary issues the foundation and this this is my own opinion and you can disagree the foundation of constitutional government lies in the principle of rule of law i'm for the sake of the students if you could one point out parts of the constitution which reinforce this principle that is if indeed i'm right that rule of law is the foundation of constitutional government where would we find this principle in the Constitution? And, uh, and, and I have a follow-up to that. And, and Tim and Mike, after Chris talks about it, if you have other thoughts, uh, uh, don't be afraid to, uh, to uh, you know, throw those in. So Chris, where would we find this notion of rule of law within the text right. of the Constitution? Uh, well, I would, I would uh, probably start with Article 6, Section 2 and Section 3, because it establishes the Constitution all laws, fasts, and treaties as the supreme law of the land. And that's in section two of Article six. And then if you jump down to uh, section three of Article six, is representatives and judges are bound by it. So the idea that this, like, this, these, um, uh, all these articles one through five are, you know, describing the function of government. Um, I also think too, and, and you guys can feel free to push back on this. And I wonder about the Republican guarantee clause in Article four. I wonder about that. And I know, David, you said in the body, but I think I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, amendments four through eight for procedural due process. Um, I think, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, we, in our last episode, we talked uh, quite a bit about some of those amendments. But I think that uh, amendment four through eight uh, helped line out procedural due process. And one of the things I think that kids need to understand about procedural due process, it gives the accused a right to be heard, right? I think that's a, that's an important thing in terms of that. So I think those are in the in the body of the Constitution as well as the, the amendments. And of course, you know, uh, to, talking about due process, we have to talk then about the Fourteenth Amendment as well because it is due process clause acting as a limiting factor on state governments. So th those would be the places I would point to off the top. And, and Mike and, and Tim, you're welcome to jump in. Mike, yeah, I. I agree with all that. And I was, I was kind of thinking, when I think of rule of law, it's, um, there's different ways to define it, but I'm thinking how we are limiting power. And so I, I think that, um, you know, the enumerated powers of Congress is, is a way, is a, is a manifestation of rule of law. I think the, 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 the impeachment of the executive is another way. Um, there, as we've learned, these are not precise and they're not always worked the way that they should. But I, I do think that that built into the Constitution, these limits of power, I think, are part of the rule of law. In addition so, to what so what you're saying is it establishes these other sections like separation of powers or checks and balances uh, establish these guardrails? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say anytime there's a process in the Constitution, uh, like, for example, uh, you know, pre presidents appoint and Senate um, uh, confirms uh, there's a process to declare war. Uh, then it then it gets handed over to president as commander in chief. There's, um, you know, the, there's as how uh, how a bill becomes a law. There's two houses involved. So anytime I would say anytime there's process in the Constitution, that equals rule of law, that it's just not 
a hundred percent arbitrarily uh, run government. There's there's processes within the system. Um, well, I th- go ahead, Chris. Well, I just I'm going to read from a small pamphlet which you guys are very familiar with. Uh, Because I want to get these right. This is from Dr. John Patrick. I think we alluded to this pamphlet, which is free to download. And I would encourage every kid to put this on their laptop or on some device. And to see all these guys are reaching for right here. Uh, There you go. Um, This is what Dr. Patrick said. uh, Laws are enforced equally and impartially. No one is above the law and everyone under the authority of the Constitution is obliged equally to obey the law. Laws are made and enforced according to established procedures, not the ruler's arbitrary will. There is a common understanding among the people about the requirements of the law and the consequences of violating the law. Laws are not enacted or enforced retroactively, ex post facto laws, as well as laws are reasonable and enforceable. So that's uh, what six bullet points laid out by Dr. Patrick under rule of law in in this little handy dandy pamphlet that I think uh, lays down that I think what we have to ask ourselves, uh, how well have we done that? So I think one of the questions that the kids are asked to deal with is America, or they, it, it, they, it presents America as an example of how effective rule of law is and that we are an example to the world of rule of law. I'm curious, do you guys all agree with that? that America is an example of rule of law? And again, I'm talking about historically. I'm not talking about 2022. You know, I'm talking about historically. Do you think we are an example to the world of rule of law? Well, I'd go yes and no. I mean, it's, there's a mixed bag on that. Um, you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think there, <laughs> there could be a ra- there could definitely be a rabbit hole here. But um, you know, just the, the fact that, um, you know, easy pickings here is, is internment. Uh, you know, there was, there wasn't a whole lot of rule of law there. Uh, fifth, fifth amendment. We don't, we don't need any fifth amendment to put you in, in relocation camps. Um, you know, eventually reparations come around to those, those, those descendants. So, um, you know, was justice done? Well, it was certainly delayed. Was justice done? I mean, so I think we always, uh, and it's, health, it's healthy to do self-reflection on our, our violations of rule of law. Ask anybody who's concerned with Gitmo, uh, whether that's rule of law. Um, so I, I, I guess my thesis statement would be it's, it's a mixed bag. Mike or Chris, any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree it's a mixed bag, and I could, if you asked me to debate one or the other side, I could give an impassioned sort of uh, argument. Well, uh, give me something. Give me yeah, something. I'm- I'd <laughs> love to hear that. I'd love to hear that other side, because I've struggled with uh, this topic for a very yeah, long honestly, time, that we're a shining city upon the hill in regards to would, s- the rule of law. No, I would say that you could, you, the best way to frame it is that we have been struggling to achieve that since the founding. But our very founding, as we know, it was based on depriving the rule of law to enslaved persons and um, to many others, right? And then you can kind of, yeah, move through history. And um, the, the, the way that, you know, students often take courses in Europe, offered in Europe on the rise of the American empire is what courses are from the founding up through the present. And it's a different way to think of our history in terms of, do we apply the rule of law to Native Americans? Do we apply the rule of law to countries that we invade and take over? Do we apply it? And you could go through there and you could, you could make a pretty impassioned argument that we haven't been living up to that standard. And in the present, there are outside organizations like Freedom House that as of right now, um, we are not ranked as a place where you have the most freedom or where the rule of law is most respected. I mean, compared to other de- democratic countries. Um, I can hear the pushback of people saying, well, I'd rather whatever, you know, it's still been the best, even though there's been this progress. And I guess it just de- depends on whether you've been a person in power or you've been able to um, not feel like what it what it's like to live on the other side of the fence where the rule of law is not there to protect you. So um, I think that argument is there to be made for sure. Well, Chris, you know, um, words on paper, and I and you and 
you guys describe some elements of the words on paper. All right, I guess my, you know, my struggle is that words have little meaning unless they exist in the hearts and minds of the people. So, you know, kind of piggybacking on this discussion, do you feel that that most Americans have inculcated the notion of rule of law into their hearts and minds? And therefore, this notion that we are an example to other nations <coughs> is a truism? I think that, um, and, I, I, and I'm not a social scientist, I'll leave this to the social scientists, but I think for most of us when we're growing <laughs> up, right, and you're a little kid, um, and, and you know, we all have children, um, and I'm sure that we've heard this numerous times that that's not fair, <laughs> right? There's that innate sense of that's not fair. So I think we kind of can see it. But I think, um, you know, in terms of how well do we enforce it, I, I've said this before, we only do it when it's convenient, right? It's we only do it when, you know, uh, it's, that's my, and I, and I don't hate to be negative. Uh, I'm going to share a couple things here. One is for the students, and I'm sure you, your teachers, you have great teachers. You guys will be looking at uh, Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail. And there's a great paragraph in there about the laws passed in Alabama, right? How can you say this is a democratically elected state legislature that you're requiring these people to follow this law, but not requiring these people to follow this law? He describes that as rule by law, not rule of law. And there are other paragraphs in there. It's one of the greatest documents in American history, I believe. Um, so I think that's important to take a look at that because Dr. King can tell you the difference between just law and non just law. And I think there's a lot of validity in that. And I think people, they struggle with that until it affects them directly, right? Um, we, we've had this discussion, Gunnar Myrdal wrote something called The American Dilemma in 1940. Uh, he was brought over by the Carnegie Institute to study uh, racism or, in America. And he called it the Negro problem in the United States. And he said, I called it the Negro problem because I couldn't call it the white people problem. Because it was a problem that white people have with African Americans, not the other way around. So I think that speaks to our struggle. And Mike alluded to that at our founding. You have uh, enslaved people, you have women, you have everybody that's outside the the us, right? And then I was, uh, I, believe it or not, Tim, I've been reading some Reinhold Niebuhr, trying to enlighten my brain here, trying to expand my uh, outlook on things. And uh, I wrote down four things that he talked about in the, uh, the irony of American history, which is a fantastic read, short read. It, it, uh, and I'll, hopefully I'll send a link, we can put that in there. One, uh, these are like four major points. The persistence in the sin of American exceptionalism. Two, History is indecipherable. Sorry, Timmy. The idea we just never really, there's no, we just constantly are looking at different things. In I would agree. I would agree to that. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I, I love this one. The false allure of simple solutions. You know, we want, we want that magic bullet. And, you know, there isn't in a country as large and diverse as ours. And, and the fourth uh, was the imperative, and it kind of what you were saying earlier, Mike, the imperative appreciating the limits of power. So, you know, you think about that, and I, I couldn't help but thinking about preparing for this discussion, what Niebuhr has said in this book, again, The Irony of American History. So do we follow rule of law? Is it baked into us? I think innately is we understand the levels of fairness, but as we grow up, we think about those people over there, right? Those people over there. I look at, I stand and, you know, say the Pledge of Allegiance, I stand for the, you know, the uh, national anthem. Um, so I'm all about American opportunity. Uh, I may not want that uh, couple moving in next to me. So I think, you know, the idea that all laws should apply equally and fairly to everybody. And I don't think that we've done a very good job of that. Well, I got to say one of the most profound things you said, Chris, and, and quoting from Niebuhr is the false illusion of simple solutions. I think that's one of the cancers that plagues America in the 21st century uh, due to a lot of cultural factors is, uh, I don't know if you remember uh, the commercial when we were kids. Oh, God, what was that chocolate drink? I want my maybe may oh, I Ovaltine. want my old team now. I want it now. And that <coughs> seems to be a part of the American culture is I want solutions now. And we look at the current issues that we're facing to, today. I want inflation solved now. <laughs> I want crime solved now. I want these things done immediately, which to me is, is in somewhat of opposition to the understanding of the American framework of rule of law. 
is that uh, you know uh, you know yeah it's just not going to happen overnight and i i'm curious tim and mike what your thoughts are and like i said in my opinion the written word is is great we study the written word but ultimately and this is the reason for civic education is to inculcate the written word the values and principles into the hearts and minds of the people where do you think we're at uh, you know on on that issue in in the 21st century do you think most americans all right, inherently believe in the rule of law in the way that the philosophers and framers intended. Mike, Tim? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have any um, <laughs> poll data that I'm looking at on this. I, I would say if you ask Americans a question like, do you support the rule of law? Do you believe, you know, we're gonna get very high numbers of people that say that. Um, now, do they actually believe that it's it's being implemented in their lives. And this gets to Tim's point that I alluded to earlier about experiences, right? Um, to me, rule of law is really a question about institutions. It's, it's a question of whether the institutions are actually working the way that they, we are being told they're supposed to work and looking after our interests. And just to just take the Great Recession, a lot of my students at USD um, went through the Great Recession as kids and watching their families um, suffer through that. And we've talked about this, I think, on other programs. You know, who was who was accountable? Who was brought to account for that sort of economic travesty? And no one was is the answer. So I th I think a, a lot of Americans have more experiences with institutions failing them, right, in these in these times, rather than actually. Um, helping them or, or proving that they, they actually work, right? And, um, and I think that's gonna have a, a major consequence on what people actually have in their hearts and minds, right? Gonna be those experiences. I, th well, I, think, me... your, I think your point, Dave, on immediacy, uh, well, my, Mike's comments about uh, institutions and processes, they're long and hard and um, we are in a culture of immediacy. So I, I think uh, I, I do tend to sh share Mike's definition of rule of law as institutional processes. Um, and we're just not a culture that likes long and slow and slow. We don't like that. Uh, so, I, so, so there's a lot of frustration. The way I take the temperature right now, the culture is there's frustration. We do want that person to come in and solve it now. You know, I alone, I alone. Yeah. But at the, at the same point, there has to be a, a, a middle path, right? I, I agree. Right. With you. I mean, thinking about, um, thinking about the Great Recession, we don't want to live in a society where we make rash judgments and we punish people without them going through a process. So that's, I think that's right. Maybe Americans would want that to happen quicker, but we're, we're what, over a decade removed from that, that, that event and nothing has happened. So right. there, there has to be like, where the processes are slow, but in the end, they hold, like this is about whole institutions holding everyone accountable for disobeying the rules that are set out. And we know that there are many examples of those people in power, whether political power, economic power, or cultural power, who simply are not held account and, and ever, right? It's not that it takes a long time, it's just it never happens. And I think that yeah. can be frustrating. So, I think one of the key questions, and I, I think it's been true for a long time, but for the 21st century is, is about citizenship. And so, Professor Williams, I'd like to, to move to that uh, topic here with you. Do you think Americans today value the principle of citizenship any more or less than previous generations? <laughs> I know it's one of those stupid. No, go. No, colors. Mike. Yeah. Uh, see you next year, Mike. <laughs> wow. Great question. I, I'm yeah. going to make one point and 150 sub points. <laughs> <laughs> I think, okay, this is so a political science y thing to do. So, Tim, you can go ahead and make your face now. But when you say, do we do Americans, do, do we value citizenship? It's like, how are we defining what that means? Because I think if we define citizenship as a set of rights, then I think, yeah, I think it's been pretty consistent over, over the course of our history that most Americans would see citizenship as um, 
be manifested through rights. If we see it as responsibilities or acts of self-governance, then I definitely think we see ebbs and flows. Um, I'm very much being influenced right now by a book that I'm reading by Robert Putnam, his newest book called The Upswing, where he basically makes this argument that over the past 125 years, we have gone from what he calls an, an I generation to a we and then back to an I. And his argument is, is that from about the time of the progressives up through the mid 1960s, we made tremendous strides in um, um, economic equality, um, lack of polarization, the sense that we're all in it together, all that kind of stuff. And it's at the height of the civil rights movement that we then see the, the downturn, right? And so I think that what that affects is I think that if we're living in a time now where people are thinking in terms of their own self-interest more than they're thinking about the common good, and we're living in a time where institutions are not working, and we're living in a time where maybe political leaders focus more on consumerism rather than actually doing stuff in the community. Yeah, I, I, I think it, I think it is different than the time of um, the 1940s and 50s for sure. So I do, I do think it ebbs and flows. Well, can I ask you, a, you know, I guess a simple question, Mike, how would you define good citizenship? How would I define good citizenship? Whether it's from a classical or liberal point of view, and, and we wanna go back to the 18th century, and maybe more philosophically, what is the definition of good citizenship? Yeah, there are different definitions. So I was just, I am, I am more of the uh, classical republicanism view on this, the Aristotle vision on this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike, that was not fair. Sorry. So, something was rising up from uh, Chris there uh, while you were talking. I apologize there, Mike. Go ahead. I, I, and then I'll let other people chime in on this. I, my, what I, look, we are, um, our experiment is with self-governance. And so people have to be involved in the governing. If, if we are simply gonna live in a, a society where I stay within my bubble and my only responsibility is not to inter, you know, intervene too much to get in your bubble, um, this experiment's gonna fail. And, and you ask people, I ask my students what's most important to them in their lives. And it always comes down to a, something about community, something about the people that are around them, their friends and their families. Really? Yeah. It doesn't come down to their, their economic status? It doesn't. Now, maybe but that's yes. because they're all wealthy, right? Um, <laughs> I, just, I don't know. I'm kidding. I don't, I'm kidding. I don't, but I do think that um, that that's my conception of good citizenship of 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 being involved in some positive way um, with your family and your community. I'll, I'll leave it there. Chris, Mike, or Chris, um, Tim. I was thinking, I was thinking a lot of things, honestly, holy smokes. Uh, something you said, Mike, made me think of another passage in Dr. King's letter. He's uh, talking about Martin Buber, uh, the great Jewish philosopher. And he says, what happens with uh, segregation, you're substituting the, uh, an I-it relationship to an I-thou relationship. So you've relegated people to uh, not even second class citizen. You're just relegating them to being non-citizens. So it's easy to pass laws that they keep them down in society, right? Um, I'm also thinking of, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think of John Donne's poem, No Man is an Island. And I think of a concept of, I first heard from Professor Williams called Ubuntu. You know, the South African concept of, and Mike, please correct me, that, but we're human through our contact through other humans. Mm -hmm. And your students talking about this. So I wonder if there's something, you know, baked into the cake, so to speak, that, you know, you're centuries apart, continents apart. And you can go back and take a look at uh, classical republicanism, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and you see some of that same kind of concept being a sense of community. And I think uh, one other thing, I think of the, uh, the American president movie written by Aaron Sorkin, where, you know, uh, Michael Douglas comes back in and gives the speech about American citizenship is hard. You got to want it. You know, you got to say, I'm going to protect this guy's right to say these things, even though it makes my blood boil and I've spent my entire life fighting against those things, but I have to understand that. And I, I would go to um, uh, uh, Judge Learned Hand, The Spirit of Liberty, right? And we've kind of alluded to, there's a great quote in the textbook, and I know it's a very famous quote about you know, constitutions and bills of rights and, and, and things like this. You gotta, it's gotta be in the hearts and minds of people, because if it's not there, you can write everything down you want, it's not gonna matter. But he also said the spirit of liberty 
is one that is not too sure that it's right. I have to weigh what I think and I believe next to what you guys think and believe. And so that's a, and that's a difficult thing for people to do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moore, any thoughts? Yeah, um, the good citizen. Wow, I, th I think I, I tend to be a communitarian as well. Um, and and I, it strikes me as a society where it relies on social capital. This is kind of riffing on another of Putnam's book earlier. He talks about uh, communities needing social capital, trust my, my neighbor, I trust. Um, and that's that's low and slow. That, that's long and hard. That kind of a society takes a long time. Um, whereas maybe uh, an individualized society where you know I'm I'm an island and I possess my rights and and leave me alone, I think that kind of society can happen very easily, but um, and it can happen fast. So a social capital society takes a long time, and uh, I, I think what we're seeing i mean to mike's point about the new putnam book if we are on this this we've passed this arc and we now are in an i society uh i think to to recover a we society and i'm not just talking about like a national community i'm just talking about like neighborhood communities uh I, I, that takes a long time and a lot of ch chatting across the fence uh, that takes a firm commitment to, to localism, and I'm not sure that we have the time or patience for that right now. Dave, well, can, I, I, can, can I ask yeah. Tim a follow-up? I'm sorry to interrupt, but so Tim, do you think our technology today has made it easier or harder to be? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think we were way too optimistic with technology there in the 90s. Okay. Uh, it's easy to cocoon. Um, yeah, I don't think it's helped. In fact, this goes to partially to what you know your guy jonathan Haidt wrote that great article a month or two ago a technologist made us uh made us not only isolated but dumber uh so i think technology plays a part of it, it um because it's easy and fast and dave i think dave's point about the immediacy culture is really i think fundamental to a lot of what we're talking about uh, yeah. low and slow is hard well, well I, uh, you know chris kind of took you know you know, anticipated my next question, and that is, you know, from a textbook point of view, Professor Williams uh, on civic education, uh, you know, the whole point of education is to build civic knowledge, civic skills, and civic aptitudes, all right? Given the 21st century, is it is it harder to be a good citizen of the United States today? And, and partly you guys address that because of technology, but I'm wondering what you all, uh, you know, I'll start with Mike, but what you all think, is it just harder today to be a good citizen because of, of, of the various factors that confront, especially young people today versus uh, when, when at least three of us were young and well, we'll include Dr. Williams on this. When we were all young, is it harder today to be a good citizen? Yeah, I think, I think it is. I think there are many reasons. I'll just focus on one here. Um, to be a good citizen in the community requires time and it requires having the time to do that. And, um, you know, we are now living in a, in, a, in a society that is the most income unequal as it's been in 125 years. And what that translates down to is that many people having more than one job or many people just trying to get, make ends meet, they don't have time to do the things that Putnam and others that we know we should be doing. Um, that's just one example, I think, of what makes it harder. Um, I think technology is another factor there as well. But um, I, I think that you need to make time for this stuff. And a lot of us, and even a lot of students, right, they don't have time to do this kind of stuff because they're busy as well. So we have a very busy society um, that makes little time for self-governance. Chris, Mike, or Tim? Well, I was I was holding this book up and I got this at a Cracker Barrel years ago waiting on a table. It's a, it's a conglomeration of stuff from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and even into the 60s about the Good Citizen Handbook. And, uh, you know, I would read it to class because there are some hilarious things in here. A, a good citizen needs meat, plenty of meat, right? Uh, a good citizen has a bowel movement at a regular time every day. So and, and that's just scratching the surface here. 
So um, <laughs> it's, scra it's scratching <laughs> something. <laughs> so this is actually kind of funny, but I would say it's, it is harder today. It's harder today because um, maybe because the lack of faith in institutions, because we talked last week uh, or the last program about uh, rights and not responsibilities, because we don't get taught that maybe we've moved further away from those classical Republican ideas that were stressed at the founding. So I think it is harder to, to do that these days. So, Tim, to what degree does federalism make it hard and complicate the system of citizenship in this country? Oh, wow. Um, it makes it hard. <laughs> well, well yeah. You know, uh, I mean, let, let me, let, here I got a, I got a story. I got a story. Um, our neighborhood is just, it's a war zone in the sense that our, our town, almost every road has construction going on. Actually, Chris can speak to this. He, he showed up at our place here about a month, uh, three, four weeks ago. And he had a hard time getting to our house because there's so many roads that are ripped up. Now, the immediate problem, the most immediate problem for all of us is how do the garbage trucks pick up our garbage every week? Because the roads are ripped up, these huge, massive, you know, so they can't get down the streets to pick up our garbage. So literally what's happened in the last two weeks in our neighborhood is a bunch of us uh, met out on the sidewalk and decided like tonight actually is when our trash cans need to go out, right? So there's been a community effort on our, literally our two or three block area where we're going to run all our, we got these trash cans on rollers. We're going to roll them down like two blocks down the street where there's no construction, where the truck can literally pick up our garbage can. We're going to mark them and spray paint them like who owns what, right? So uh, federalism allows for good citizenship at the local, because this is not a national government issue, whether my trash gets picked up. This is a local government issue. So there's some space for local communities at the neighborhood level to band together and do something. Now, and I've actually met some people in the neighborhood. I'm building some social capital over trash, <laughs> um, I, I guess. Who, who would have thought it? But, you know, so there's all kinds of opportunities at the local level. And it's so easy. It is so easy at the local level. Now, I think um, I heard somebody recently say that only 15 percent of people actually turn out and do their political stuff at the local level. Um, but I think citizenship is more, you know, I think we'd all agree it's more than these political voting things. It's, it's uh, we've banded together, get our, get our garbage in a place to get picked up. So that's at the local level. And so uh, I think federalism provides all these entry points. I think that's a phrase that Mike has used before. Whether we will use, go through those doors into those entry points is, the, I think, the better question. Chris, Mike, uh, does federalism, I mean, let's get to that question because I've always struggled with this uh, because it means dual sovereignty. And I don't believe you can have dual sovereignty. Uh, that's a 60s uh, liberal notion of mom and dad being co-equal partners. Uh, that didn't exist in my family. I lived in a world of wait till your father gets home. All right. And, and then, you know, while I was waiting, I shook in my shorts and wet myself numerous times uh, as I waited till my father got uh, home uh, there. And I, I hate to be sexist on that, but uh, dual sovereignty prevents a dilemma to me because citizenship implies a notion of loyalty. And can you be loyal to two different entities, uh, which and that would be the state and national government. And therefore, it complicates. It also complicates the ballot. All right. And, 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 you know, creates problems that way. That that's my view. I'm wondering, Chris and Mike, what you guys think. Michael. Um, I don't, I, I think there's some issues with federalism. I don't share your concern about being loyal to two different governmental entities, I guess. Um, well, you're a political scientist, not a historian. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd understand that, I guess. I mean, I guess I just kind of think that, since the Civil War, I don't know. I, I think I think for large, I cannot. I can't say that. It's not a problem for me. It's not a problem <laughs> for me. Um, and I think that given some of the most recent sort of Supreme Court decisions, I think it's that may change. Maybe I'll value my California citizenship a lot more. Um, then because the I believe California would protect things that I want protected, whatever, right? Um, 
but I, I do think what, what Tim's example brings out, that's the promise of federalism, that it gives us more ways to be active citizens, right? And it gives governments more ways to experience, to, to experiment with policies to meet people's needs. I just listened to this um, great interview, I'll try to find it, put it in our notes, um, about the, the housing crisis in America. And this scholar argues, look, in our federal system, we should see lots of different ways for local communities to deal with the housing crisis. But what we have seen is the exact opposite. We see very little experimentation. In every community, we see the same kind of thing. Big developers as an interest group getting a hold of politicians and everyone is a NIMBY. No one wants a development project in their neighborhood. I think her she was citing that 75% of all land in the United States is zoned for single house dwellings, which is a radical departure of the way we did things 100 years ago. So whereas federalism should open up these, 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 these access points and, for, and allow for experimentation, we just don't see that happening. We kind of see a race to the bottom in a lot of ways with a lot of issues. Um, communities not wanting to be too generous with their policies because they don't want those other people to come and take advantage of them. So um, we're kind of seeing the exact opposite of the hope of federalism. Um, I would say that yes and no. I, I think of Tim's example is really good. Of course, I can't help but think of Tip O'Neill and all politics is local, right? Because people want their trash collected. They want their roads fixed. You know, they want all these things and local governments to do that. But I also think um, I would agree with Mike that also, especially states, David, talking about, you know, two, two layers of sovereignty here. I think today uh, with our mindset, it allows us to retreat back into our states, right? And that, you know, well, I'm surrounded by people who think like me and act like me. And, you know, we elect people to go to the state legislature and they're going to make they're going to make laws and rules that, um, you know, really reflect what we want here now with those uh you know, people out in Washington, D.C. want, realizing that those people in Washington, D.C. also represent all the other states, too. So I think that it, it provides an avenue for participation, uh, you know, the, the cracks in the system, so to speak, as Mike's talked about the idea of participating, but it also allows an avenue of retreat to go back into our tribes. You know, I, I think the civil rights movement is a great example of bottom-up forcing the national. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't help but think that Fred Shuttlesworth decided in his community to get his kids enrolled in a school. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning uh, of a, a radical set of things that took take place in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, the, the national government follows in a lot of ways. And so I think that um, there's a lot of local citizenship that's really forced the hand of state and national. Uh, and that's in part why I think I, I tend to be kind of a localist communitarian. Um, well, I, I am wondering, you know, in unitary system, you still have subunits that deal. I mean, I look at the British system. I spent some time this week reading about it. Yeah. You still have subunits of the unitary system that are dealing with local issues. All right. But ultimately, law is is universal you know uh, at, at the parliamentary level uh, uh, there so I you know I, I do wonder about the contrast between that unitary parliamentary system in England and then the federal system in the United States and its impact on on citizenship so Chris I do want to shift a little bit to the the framework of the Constitution and this kind of deals with Tim's I think new bumper sticker low and slow uh, as uh, the American mantra. It's also how what? you cook brats. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> Not how you eat brats, though. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you're still young. You can eat those things fast. I have to nibble on mine uh, <laughs> for quite a while. But one of the strengths, uh, uh, Professor Kavanaugh, I believe that the framers saw in our constitutional framework was that decisions could not, at least at the national level, could not be made quickly. They, and they were not subject to the passion and whims of the people because of separation of powers, checks and balances, federalism, forms of representation. Uh, so they, in, they intentionally created a system that would be low and slow uh, in the dream world of Professor Moore. 
Yet what's interesting is that many today see that as a flaw. They see that as creating a government with an inability to respond to problems. So I'm curious about your thoughts. Is the framework of the Constitution of the 18th century weakened our government's ability to address problems of the 21st century? Um, no. I think okay. it, I think you can it's build uh, on that just a little bit. Uh, I think it's operator error. I think it's, you know, uh, I'm going to date myself here, a little Rompo Peel rotisserie oven, right? You don't set it and forget it. You, he's a guy, Mike, that was on television, sold all kinds of crazy stuff. Thank you. I was, I was lost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Um, so I, I don't think, I think it does provide us a framework. And you're absolutely right, David. I always think of the three D's, discuss, debate, deliberate. You know, this is what Congress is designed to move slowly, right? And it is a protection because we know, we've said this many times on this program, that it's about a limited government. But it also has, you know, the idea that we can, if we have this, the political will, address things that are immediate. I think of climate change. It's, there's no greater threat to our planet than climate change right now. And it, we have the ability within the document it's just we don't have the political will right now among our elected officials to do anything about it. And even though you could debate it and you can discuss it and all those kinds of things, we can get that. I mean, holy cow, how long did it take to pass the Patriot Act? Well, let, let me ask you this, Chris. Here's a, another example. You're absolutely right. Climate change is a perfect example. But let's, let's look at gun violence. All right. Within the parliamentary systems of Australia, Canada and England, confronted with gun violence, especially with semi-automatic military-style weapons, they responded within a fairly brief time after a, a, a mass shooting. You know, we're into how many years of mass shootings and we still don't have an effective law. So it seems to me that our system, all right, of government is an impediment and I'll bring well, Mike into again, this. Again, again, David, I disagree. I don't think it's the system. I think it's the people running the system, right? Again, I, I agree. I mean, holy smokes, the leading cause of infant but, mortality in this country today is gunshot. Think about that. Right. 45,000 kids a year die from gunshot. We don't have the political will because of a special interest group um, to, to get things, meaningful gun legislation done. And I remember when Australia banned that, and I was... I've told a story about a, a parliament you know, who's a leader of a is a governor of a province in Australia, very conservative guy. But they asked him, "What's your what's your job as a politician in Australia?" He said, "My job is to do what I think is best for the people, and I think it's what's best for the people is we start to round up some of these really violent guns, or these really guns that we don't necessarily need. And trust me, Australia's got a deep gun history as well, a deep gun history." Um, the, uh, the, the interviewer then that, goes thus speak. proving my point is we have well, we again, finish, I know. Ahead, finish, sorry because then the same interviewer interviews um, the chief of staff or uh, former speaker of the house Harry Reid and he said what's the goal of American politicians and his first response was to get reelected and you can't get reelected without money and support so again the system itself is not flawed I think it's operator error and you guys can definitely push back all you want well, yeah, because money is part of the system. It's not operator error. The problem is, and again, and I'm skeptical, but every polling data, <laughs> all the polling data I see is, is that a majority of Americans believe in, I guess, what has been labeled common sense regulation of guns, background checks, all right, education, licensing, those kind of things. And that's, you know, 70% of Americans believe in that. So there's the will. The problem is, is the money in the system, which Australia, Canada, and England don't have to deal with. But that's part of the system. That's part of the constitutional structure, according to the Supreme Court of the United States. Money is speech. And therefore, the First Amendment in the United States uh, Constitution, uh, you know, protects. And therefore, that is, it's an institutional problem, not the will of the people problem. It's an institutional problem. So I'm pushing back on Chris, Tim, and or, or Mike. If you want some uh, insight on that, jump on it. Well, I you think don't. talking about rights, um, I think rights complicates it and automatically makes it more difficult. I, I mean, I get, I'm stuck with the uh, with the notion that um, citizenship 
impact. Uh, I still, you know, if you, if you want something done, you're not going to go uh, ask somebody in Washington, D.C. Um, like garbage or street issues or, or schools, stuff like that. So I guess rights to me automatically slows and stifles the discussion about citizen impact because there's this high bar that we have and our, uh, this, this high bar commitment to individual rights. And that automatically complicates citizenship behavior. Um, so I, I guess I'm I'm more um, I'm I'm more uh, communitarian in thinking about where can I get my garbage picked up? Who is going to deal with that? Where am I going to get a stop sign on a street corner that needs a stop sign? Where are we going to get speed bumps installed? Um, what, what's your really... bar what what's your barrier to Chris's uh, notion? Climate change is, and I agree with him, the right. most important issue of the 21st century. Well, so it might where's be. your citizenship on that? Well, that and but that that plays like to your point uh, that these there are these national issues and the, and there's a stifling that's taking place at the national level, and we could talk ad infinitum about what why that why that is. But I'm saying for most people, uh, they, they want uh, these very basic things addressed, and, and it's much more effective uh, for them to hoot, hoot and holler at their local officials to get them done. And, and this is where I get lost. Um, you said yourself, and all the data shows, when it comes to local government, very few people participate. So if right. very few people participate, how can it be at the front of their mind that these are the most pressing issues, our local issues? Right. I yeah, think because a lot of people don't see politics as citizenship. Explain that. They see them in much more basic terms. Uh, citizens, good citizenship for them is not tied into the political or constitutional system. It's like, does this guy have a bowl of soup? And do I have an obligation to him or her? Uh, so I, I think a lot of people probably don't buy your assumption of politics equals citizenship. Mike, Chris, your thoughts? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to, I tend to go with Chris's argument that it's um, user error because I can think of those times in American history where the system has gotten a lot of big things done. But Dave, you said something about speech, and, and this is more of an empirical question. Um, you know, since the Buckley decision in the 70s, as that being part of the system, do we see, is that a major factor in the ability for government to get things done? And I also was thinking about the administrative state. And I was thinking about this nationally and statewide. And again, it was this program I was listening to. It was the Ezra Klein show, and I'll put the interview in the, in the, the notes. Um, and the scholar was arguing that some of the things that came out of the environmental movement, like we want, we can't build anything without an environmental assessment, which most people think is a good idea. Like, yeah, we want to make sure, right? But what it does in California, California's version of this law, <laughs> is it makes developing things, building things really, really cumbersome and really, really expensive and, and open all these processes. And our point was that, um, yeah, we're not able to get things done as quickly as we want because we've set up these processes to slow things down even more. So I, I guess what I have students to think about, Dave, that you brought up, because this is a really good question, is, is what are the things that are part of the system now um, that maybe haven't always been there? And do we see like, could the interstate highway bill get passed in today's, <laughs> today's system, given Buckley and given the rise of environmental protections. And I mean, would it have been um, an easy as a, and polarization, I think polarization is the obvious thing to bring up, but we've been polarized different times in our history. So while I tend to agree with Chris, that I think that it, it is user error, um, I think there is, I think there's something there with defining the system more broadly than the contours of the constitution itself and thinking about these other changes and, and seeing how that's uh, impacted it. So we, we, we probably couldn't get the Louisiana purchase done right now, could we? <laughs> I, 
Uh, you're circling back to rule of law issues or what are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, take other people's land. There would be, uh, I think, uniformity in America. That, well, that's okay. I, I wanna, David, I would agree with you to a point that there are systemic things like money has become part of the system, right? It has, it, we, and we can't get away. Well, we, the thing is we could get away from it. We're just not willing to do that. I would also say uh, the current issues that we're having with the court, you can see it's about a struggle for power, right? To maintain a certain power to make sure we get certain justices on the court because then we can shape and mold things the way we want. And we, and we obviously in this uh, rash of cases that came out towards the end of the term, uh, it frosted a lot of people's granola on that um, in terms of, you know, holy smokes, but that's, is that part of the system, you know? And I might argue uh, about my least favorite thing in the United States Senate. That's probably part of the system as well. I love the phrases that come up amongst you guys. I, I've never heard frosted somebody's granola, and I don't even know what that means. Uh, <laughs> whatever, to be you quite to, honest. whatever you wanted to. <laughs> come, <laughs> come live in the upper Midwest. Your uh, granola will that, get frosted. Frost, frosting granola. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to close this conversation, uh, I think, with uh, a holistic maybe discussion judgment on the 21st century and where we're headed, we have through our multiple conversations <coughs> in this program, referenced the outstanding work of Ornstein and Mann regarding America's broken Congress. Uh, this week I read an article in the Atlantic entitled, America's Self-Obsession is Killing Its Democracy. It was written by Brian Kloss of the University College in London, where he claims that American democracy is dying and the chances of recovery are slim. And he's looking at history as far as when we look at democracies, when they start to suffer from some kind of cancer and begin dying off, there's very little chance of recovery and they morph into something not authoritarian at 100%, but not democracy at 100%. So I'm wondering what your reaction uh, to his claim that we are a dying democracy and if so, how would you suggest we re revive America's constitutional uh, democracy? So, uh, Professor Williams, we'll start with you on this one. Do you have thoughts or would you like to defer for a moment? Sorry, did, did you say me? I, I, yeah, I, uh, Professor Williams, yeah. yeah. Um, sure, I'll start. I haven't read that article, but um, I, I'll pull it up and read it. It sounds like a good one. Um, and I think I've I think I've said this on this program before. Um, thinking of the decline or rise of democracy, not in terms of like an on or off switch, but like a dimmer switch, and um, that I am I am with those scholars who would say that this is a moment of some real important national sort of self reflection and and thinking where we're at, where we're going. Um, I think all the signs are are there in terms of going from the international, like we are a declining empire, for sure. Um, I, I think that the 21st century is gonna be obviously the, the century of China rising and America declining. There's gonna be domestic consequences of that. And then as we kind of come more in, we are a country with, as we've said already, very large economic um, inequalities, um, a system where our ins institutions don't seem to be working um, and a system where we are, some scholars call it self-sorting with our information and where we live and who we talk to, we are becoming more and more fractured. And that is the recipe for societies to turn towards um, leaders or um, processes that will make promises of fixing those types of things in ways that won't, won't be democratic, they won't be small L liberal. And eventually, I think history shows um, those promises do not come to fruition. But what you're left with is um, a society where people don't have the, the freedoms that they had before. So um, I, I do think it's, it's, there's, there's no more urgent time, I think, in, in at least the last, since the Civil War, that we should be thinking seriously about what, what we're teaching, what we're doing, and how we are going to keep this rock from we, we at least have to like keep the rock in place. I, I think the rock is coming down the hill. And I think if we can just stop it from rolling 
and catch our breath. It's not necessarily pushing up the hill right now. It's just stopping it because I think we're, we're heading towards bad times. Well, can I ask you, you know, um, Professor Kloss's argument, and, and one of the things, I mean, and he seems to be very honest, that all the solutions, we have solutions to this dying democracy, but they would take an amendment, yet our amendment process is, is, is devised in such a way that it's nearly impossible under current conditions. Would you agree with me on that, Professor Williams? That we really can't fix it because the problems are inherent in the amendment process. Okay, I would say two things. I do think the amendment process is way too difficult for us to change things in the Constitution. So I agree with that. I don't think that that's the, I don't think that's the only way to fix things. I think this is a, a more broadly, a, it's a cultural issue as well. It is sort of a structural issue. And again, this Putnam book, his thesis is going to be, we, we spent a lot of time, he spent a lot of time talking about this decline. He wants to understand how did we go from the 19, early 1900s, what seeds were planted that got us on the path to getting out of these problems? And, and to our point earlier, this is, if, this is gonna take some time, but what seeds could be planted? And, and one comes to mind is that some sort of federal regulation on information on the internet, like something needs to be done about the sorts of information that is allowed and to be out there. That seed could be planted and we may not see the consequences of that for 20 years, but something needs to be done, small steps, not, not even small steps, but it's gonna take things like that to be done now that maybe in 20 years, the tide will have been reversed. So I don't think amending the constitution is the only way to do this. I think there's other things that could be done. Chris? Um, gosh, I, I'm going to recommend some books to folks. Um, the first one is, uh, I, I just got on listening to this on a, my a road trip earlier. It's called On Tyranny by a scholar, Timothy Snyder. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really good. And look at the expanded version, because this, this came out in 2016 against the backdrop of the American campaign for the presidency. But the expanded version uh, includes multiple, about 20 chapters on um, Ukraine and what's going on in Ukraine. And he does talk about the dimmer switch that Mike, M Mike alluded to the idea of if it starts to go out in Ukraine, you know, is that dimmer switch getting turned down? And that's really, really powerful stuff. Uh, I would encourage anything by Hannah Arendt, who was a Holocaust survivor and uh, written extensively on totalitarianism. Um, a, 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 an author who actually was a war correspondent. His name is Sebastian Younger. And he's got two small, he's got multiple books. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen the documentary for Strepo, it's about a, a military outpost in Afghanistan, it's powerful stuff. But um, this is a guy that's, you know, as a reporter has put himself in the middle of things. One book is called Tribe and the other book is called Freedom. Both excellent books, short, easy reads, but talks about, you know, the idea of when we have freedom and also about tri two different books. Um, I would encourage that. And now I'm going to sound like I'm, I'm reversing course. I'm not reversing course because I don't think we have the political will to change it. So I'm going to share an article in our notes written by a local humanitarian scholar, Clay Jenkinson, who alluded to your very thing earlier, uh, David, about rewriting the Constitution every 19 years, courtesy of Mr. Jefferson. Um, because I do think because, because we can't control ourselves, structural changes need to be made. If we could control ourselves and we could step away from the ugliness that we seem to be in the middle of, the, the tools are there. But I don't know that we can overcome human nature. So perhaps we need to change the rules and maybe restructure the Constitution. I'll share that uh, article in our notes. Thank you. Professor Moore. Yeah, I have, um, I have two thoughts. One's a historical and one's maybe a cultural. Um, you know, the progressive era, there were two kinds of progressives, it seems to me. They were scared to death progressives, conservatives, like Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, there was the more, um, you know, liberal progressives. So I think the Gilded Age scared people to death. And uh, it seemed to me that a lot of progressivism uh, was born out of this weird alliance of 
conservative progressives and, and liberal progressives. Maybe, maybe the classic example is studying TR and studying Wilson. I think they're very different kinds of progressives. Um, so, so we're, I, I've long contended that we're in a second, we're in a new Gilded Age. And so um, maybe to try to interject a little um, optimism, which is, I'm usually not prone to do, <laughs> <laughs> we we look down the barrel of uh the gilded age and reach some sort of consensus to do progressive stuff and both conservatives and liberals did it um i think i think people ought to maybe be thinking about and reading about the gilded age and, and a little bit about the populist uh, anger and, and the progressive solutions the Tell other me, thing we... i can't the other thing that i think you know, to be a little pessimistic, I think it's a cultural issue primarily. We live in a postmodern world where tribes, identity and tribes, and then you throw in, there's some Canadian philosophers that have coined this phrase, expressive, radical expressive individualism. Um, we're in that. We are in that, and it militates against any collective at any level. Uh, so I think there's a cultural problem that may be our undoing. I, I saw this article and I wanted that you referenced, David. It's, it looks like something that I would be very much interested in reading. So I think there's a cultural piece here, but I also think there's some, some maybe a glimmer of optimism historically. We survived the Gilded Age with progressive solutions and both sides of the aisle agreed to do stuff. Uh, so, so maybe, maybe crap drives people to solutions. That seems to be the reading of American history. So we're coming up against the clock, gentlemen, as we've uh, uh, created this tradition. Uh, and this being the last uh, program of the summer sessions, uh, as we take a break and uh, get ready for the next academic year, uh, I'll leave it to you to decide uh, to provide any insights or recommendations about unit six or just any insights or recommendations about students heading into their civics and government courses and teachers who are teaching those courses that you would like to provide uh, for them here in our last session of the summer of 2022. There, Professor Williams, thoughts, insights, recommendations. Hey, you know, I first started teaching in 1999 um, and Right, right, right. There was the Bush v. Gore, right? That election. I remember thinking, ah, what a wonderful, like, as a teacher, it's like, a, this is a teaching moment, right? <laughs> I was so young and naive not to realize that the teaching moments are always there. There's always, and I'm, it's, it's always been there. So I, what I would encourage students to do is to um, think about this this curriculum and these ideas that are in the textbook and that we've been discussing and um, see how they are actually <laughs> occurring every day in the newspaper and on the news and in your community. These are not abstract um, ideas and these are not ideas that are just meant um, for the history books. They are alive and well. We are living through another teaching moment um, with the January 6th hearings, with the Supreme Court decisions, with the upcoming elections. I mean, it's, it's all just there for the taking in terms of um, being, a, being a, a critical citizen in terms of, of thinking through these, these difficult issues and deciding for yourself where you stand right now. Um, if you're a student, that means you're in high school or whatever, right? Um, and taking stock of that and, and seeing what flows from that. Professor Kavanaugh. Um, what Mike said, right? <laughs> but, but I would, yeah. uh, I'm gonna, I'm sorry to, I mean, that's a good stuff, Michael, thank you. But I would also say for students, and here's the challenge, you know, can, Timmy's gotta get his trash collected, right? The people in his neighborhood in Waukesha, they gotta get their trash collected. So how are you gonna deal with issues like that? Now, I want you to zoom out, you know, to, holy cow, we got the new web telescope, right? And showing us incredible things from the universe. I saw a poster, uh, it was in black and white, you know, from, gosh, from a deep space probe. And it had to have an arrow pointing to the earth. 
because it put things in perspective, you know, we're just all on this spaceship hurtling through this blackness. So from the street level in Waukesha to that, you know, out in this universe, be able to think on all those levels, which is really difficult, but think, right? What Mike said, pay attention to what's going on. Every moment is a teaching moment. And I would also say this, have big ideas. Don't let old codgers like us, except Michael, don't let old codgers like us tell you, oh, that's not practical. You can't do that. That's BS, man. That's bovine fecal matter. Think big. I want you to really think big because we're we're relying on any students watching this. We're relying on you to make sure that things, you know, it's not the, it's not the rotisserie oven. We can't just set it and forget it. So from one bovine to another, Professor Moore. I, I thank you. I, uh, I was, I was kind of digging uh, uh, Mike's reference to Sisyphus there earlier. I mean, we got a little good mythology. Um, I think unit six is, uh, after unit two, unit six is my favorite. Uh, because I see in unit six, it's an opportunity for, for folks to think about different theories of what a good citizen is. And embedded in that is a good citizen local, good citizen state, good citizen national. Uh, so you, it really is a conceptual unit. I think a lot of people see Unit 6 as current events, but it's embedded in it is an opportunity to think about citizenship theory, really. Um, and the other great opportunity Unit 6 provides is this idea of identity and loyalty. What are we loyal to? How, how committed are we to local, state, and national? I think political scientists use uh, thick and thin, our commitments. What are we committed to? What level are we committed to? Who, what people are we committed to? So I think citizenship theory and, and identity and loyalty are the big unspoken ideas in Unit 6. And those are fun. Those are absolutely great discussions to have. So teachers and students, uh, Unit 6 is, it's obviously a culminating unit. It's the last unit of uh, the We the People text. Um, most of us have seen it as a culminating unit uh, there. Uh, and, uh, but I do think it provides much more freedom and latitude for students to explore uh, the ultimate uh, meaning, if that's the right phrase, uh, of the Constitution as it applies uh, in the 21st century. So uh, think about that as, uh, as you begin uh, your studies. I would also recommend to every teacher and to every student who views this uh, to get a hold of the numerous closing statements from the January 6th committee hearings, whether it's uh, Congressman Raskin or Cheney or Kissinger or, or, and I'm forgetting some of the other names, there have been some profound and, and I think poetic and beautiful insights into the American mind and the American uh, constitutional culture uh, by these uh, members of the committee, and it's bipartisan in my opinion. Uh, uh, that is, there's both Republicans and Democrats who are saying and providing for us some insights into our constitutional way of life. As we, and I firmly believe this, I firmly agree with uh, uh, Professor Brian Kloss from University College in London uh, that we are on the edge of the cliff as far as a democratic uh, society and so I highly recommend that uh, you don't have to watch all the hearings, but get the closing statements of uh, uh, some of these committee members because they're pretty profound. Uh, so we come to an end to our summer session, uh, obviously to this program on uh, uh, Unit 6. Uh, we've enjoyed our time together. Uh, we are planning, at least for right now, to uh, come back sometime in late August, September, but who knows, uh, it's impossible to predict the future at this point of what's gonna be happening. Uh, if, uh, if, if it doesn't, uh, it's been enjoyable. Uh, we hope we've provide, provided you uh, uh, with what we promised, that is some foundational ideas about our constitutional arrangement and uh, some maybe uh, alternative viewpoints about uh, the American constitutional culture. So hopefully we'll see you in the future. Uh, until then, peace. Love, yogurt tacos, bye-bye, bye bonds. <laughs>